Hello, everybody. My name is Miguel Valenzuela, and welcome back to Creative Thinkers. So today we have a very special guest. This is Gabriel Gaitan. He is a uh, visual artist and an educator. So welcome, Gabriel. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Miguel, for inviting me. So uh, I'm very, very glad that you came. Uh, I know that uh, you are an artist, you're a creator, you're an individual who thinks outside the box. So this is perfect for us, right? Well, thank so, you. I actually want to start by uh, finding out a little bit more about how you grew up. So when you were a child, what types of things did you do and what kinds of uh, influences did you have from a very, very young age? Mm. Well, what happened when I was growing up is that I had a, a mother that had a vision. Uh, she migrated from Juarez, Mexico to El Paso to make her, her, her life a better, have a better life, you know, because she was struggling in Juarez with my dad and all that. So she wanted something better for her, her kids, so she moved. She migrated to here to El Paso, became a citizen. And then uh, when I was born, I was, from an early age, I was taught to be proud of who I am and where I come from. Culture. In my culture and all that. And I actually flunked second grade because I didn't know very good English. <laughs> But the household, it was all Spanish. Right. So it was kind of hard transition from Spanish to English. But so you, I, I, you I more or less had to find creative ways to get around that, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. And so I ended up, you know, not passing second grade just because of my lack of English. But then, you know, um, I, I moved on and, you know, picked it up. And so forth. So I would speak English and Spanish, well, sometimes Spanish in school, because at the time it was not allowed to speak Spanish in school. I'm talking about the 60s and all that. But at home, mostly Spanish. Um, we speak to our mom and dad in English so they can pick it up themselves. Correct. So, you know, we're uh, adjusting to the you know, culture here in the United States, what I like to call Mexican American. Later right. on, I call it Chicano. So Very good. That was later on in my life. But, uh, and well, with that in mind, uh, so I grew up, my, you know, going up and down to, you know, going to and from Juarez for a lot of events, you know, uh, carnivals, haircuts, you know, dinner, whatever with my parents. So, you know, it was, um, El Paso and Juarez was like one city for us right. at the time because we lived in the, sec in the Segundo and Second Ward. And then, um, so I enjoyed the, uh, the cultures of both sides, and I understood why... I'm Mexican and, and an American citizen. So, you right. know, with that idea, I, I enjoyed uh, being both cultures. And then uh, later on, I started picking up, you know, some of the traditions, especially I used to see my grandmother in Juarez. She had all these calendars <laughs> with a lot of imagery, a lot of art. Those really colorful ones yeah. would say an uh, Aztec warrior yeah, yeah, or something Aztec like that. and all that. And I used to say, and then, of course, and I saw them in my parents' house because the, Bakers, we used to give them away, give them yeah, out. I remember to, that. Yeah, I remember people, those days. You know? So we all had those, you know, and we had calendars, uh, Aztec calendars in the kitchen and stuff. And I was, was cu very curious about those. So we, I was raised with a lot of color and, and, and visuals, you know, because of the festive um, culture that I right. was grew up, grew up with in Juarez and in El Paso. Do you think that having all these colors, this imagery, uh, helped you become the individual that you are? I think so. I, I, I think uh, it just increased the idea of, of the pride of being uh, Mexican descent. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, the respect to the U.S. government. But the, the beauty about being raised in the United States is that you have, you have rights. You know? <laughs> and you, can, you have the right to celebrate who you are, you know, as long as you don't offend or bother anybody else. And I think the indigenous thinking of being Mexican uh, led me to be more of a complete person. In which aspect? You know, like, well, I was raised with a lot of respect for elders and, and one another, and the indigenous thinking is the same thing, you know. And, and, and that's what I realized, I think, with my parents, is that a lot of the uh, indigenous thinking in Mexico um, carries over to generations and generations, because without knowing, <laughs> You have it in, in, your, in, in, in yourself if, because you're raised with that respect. You're raised with that uh, 
a pride of, of being who you are and so forth. And aside from the pride, <coughs> I think we had spoken a little bit before about how there are a lot of connections within uh, the indigenous culture as far as art, math, science. Right. Tell us a little bit about that because well, I feel that it's also connected. Yeah, uh, well, one of the things later on in, in my life, I realized that uh, why I used to enjoy math and painting at the same time is because in Mexico, um, with my parents' education, they're, it's more integrated. You know, the arts and, and, and the mathematics and the sciences are more integrated than here in the United States. In the United States, when I was ra being raised and going to public schools, it seemed to be separated. And it would give more value to academia, you know, the science and the math, and less attention to the arts. And why is it important to give more attention to the arts? Well, when I was going to school, I noticed that. But I used to enjoy taking art. <laughs> Uh, and I, I always saw math and science to be, I mean, math and uh, arts being together because when I would draw something, well, you know, I would measure. You know, right. I would use math you know, to uh, figure out, you know, the, the balance of composition and so forth. So it was easy for me to use math in my arts. You know, I, I teach a, a drawing class here at the college, and it's a continuing ed education class. And, when I, we, we teach the grid, you know, and we teach, and I teach them to center things up, to measure the paper. Some of the students say, well, I didn't think we needed to do math with art. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, it's very simple math. <laughs> Just divide the paper into four, you know, this type of thing, you know, and, and ideas like that, you know. And, and they're, they're, that's why I'm telling you that it was, it's separated, like uh, art and, and math is separated. And for me, it's it's together and I think it comes from the indigenous thinking that everything is related that we're all you know we're all, we're all scientists and artists and 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 then it's not separated and I think that's what makes a, my opinion a human being complete is having the balance of you know the left brain and the right brain working together very good so speaking about left brain and right brain when you moved <coughs> on high school and college what was it about those two eras within your life that helped you become who you are as an individual, creatively speaking? Well, I started drawing when I was like in sixth, fifth grade that I remember. Uh, I used to do my own little posters, you know. What was it, a legal size paper? Redraw uh, Marble and DC comic characters, mm -hmm. you know, Thor, Superman, and so forth. And I realized that I had a little, you know, little talent of drawing. You know, like, right. And my parents, Especially my mom would encourage me. She would, I would put it up in your room and this and that. And then I, when I was going to elementary school, and at, at the time the elementary was first, you know, kinder to eighth grade. You know, right. There mm -hmm. was no middle school at the time I was going to school. So I ended up in seventh grade. And I, I took art, and that's when I got uh, exposed to color. Awesome. And and I brought actually a, a painting that I wanted to show you. Is this that, one of your earliest paintings? Yeah, I did in 1968, which is an elementary. And I just wanted to show you the, um, the, the drawing here. So and one of the things that I noticed is that the colors are really vivid. That's something that you were exposed to at that point and you really brought it through? Yeah, and what happened, I think, is that I already had the color within me and when I got exposed to the technique of painting, I usually, you know, I just put those bright colors together, and and uh, the teacher was so impressed with this, but she didn't let me sign it. <laughs> she said, <laughs> "Why is let that? Let me sign it for you." <laughs> and, and you can tell, you know, because she put an O on, on the name Gaitan instead of an A, but that's okay. And she actually dated '68, and she was really impressed. Now this is painted on tempera on a cardboard. Oh wow! Cardboard bends when you wet it. Correct. So I can't really frame it flat, so I have a kind of like a shadow box. <laughs> then nice. I still have it. It's in my living room. That's beautiful. And then I moved on to high school, and I started doing, I got more into uh, acrylic painting. And my art, my art teacher in high school, which influenced me a lot in my career, because I wanted to go, to, my parents had insisted on me go to college. Correct. And I wanted to, had to choose a a career, so I said, I want to be an art teacher because this art teacher in high school 
really impressed, you know, put a lot of impression on, impressed me because uh, they said, I want to do what he's doing. And, and in this particular piece, there's, you know, we're supposed to draw um, a landscape. Right. And I did like a, an imaginary, you know, <laughs> landscape, uh, some, uh, another planet or something. And I put a bean here that's a bean that is floating. I think that calls for a lot of imagination. And that one's very modern, too. Yeah. And here, I also see that you start to incorporate religious iconography. Yeah, well, this, La Virgen de Guadalupe, it started because, you know, my mom, you know, we're, we're Catholic, so my mom had Virgen de Guadalupe uh, everywhere, in a sense. And also, it's part of the cultural Mexicano. Mm -hmm. You know, whether you're Catholic or not, it's everywhere in Mexico, so um, I wanted to do my own interpretation of at the time when I was in high school. And I angled the, uh, the canvas the canvas instead of making it where I think it lends itself more. Oh, I love it. And then also, <clears throat> um, the, going back to the calendars <laughs> of the bakery and, 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 and all the molinos, um, this was an influence of the, I uh, believe the artist's name is Olguera. Exactly. And, mm -hmm. and he's a one Mexican artist that really painted his, actually painted his <clears throat> wife. He used to use her wife as a, as a model. Oh, is that who it is, yeah, usually? Yeah, when I did a research on him, that's what apparently was, it was his wife. Wow, that beautiful, is really beautiful cool. wife. <laughs> yeah. And, and, uh, and used, of course, indigenous people as models to uh, paint these uh, imageries of, you know, we don't have photography, photographs of Guatemoc and, you know, <laughs> all these leaders from Mexico. So um, this, he would then recreate them in life. Exactly. Know, and then paint them. And, He's, he is a very, very good realistic painter. And I think all of that came from a whole nationalistic point of view in Mexico that yeah. was happening at the time. Yeah. So now you're in college yeah. after high school. Right. What do you start to do? What's your, what are your interests? Where are you going from here? Well, what happened in, in, um, in, high, in, in, in high school uh, during the, uh, I went to high school from 69 to 73. I had an older brother who was about four years older than I was. And... He started getting into the Chicano movement mm -hmm. at the time. And the Chicano movement was just a realization that we were uh, U.S. citizens of Mexican descent, and we had a lot of indigenous history. Right. Which usually was not taught <coughs> during the time because, I don't know, I guess the indigenous history was not important Correct. in education. But the Chicano woman kind of realized that, that it is important. It is part of our culture as Mexican-Americans. Absolutely. As Chicanos. So uh, that's where we get a lot of our influence of food, the way we talk. And, artwork. And, and the artwork and, the, you know, the picture writing, um, the, uh, all the fiestas, the uh, celebrations of life. You know, and that's one of the reasons that I think we celebrate the Day of the Dead is celebrating life because it's not the end. It's a new beginning Absolutely. Of, of another life, in a sense. And, but we, we, as Mexicanos, we celebrate it because uh, we are celebrating life. And life is to, to live, not to, you know, to die. Absolutely. <laughs> You're going to die eventually, so why don't you enjoy your life right now? Yeah, why don't you live? Yeah. So, so with that in mind, uh, you know, <coughs> I, I continued. Uh, I, then I started learning more about myself through, uh, uh, as a Chicano. Because, of course, I wasn't in Mexico learning. Mm -hmm. I was in the United States learning. And I then I started realizing that I am indig indigenous, too. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not Spanish, you know, and, and Indian. No, I'm more indigenous because I was born here in, in the Americas, here in Mexico. And more of my, my culture is based on the indigenous thinking, you know, uh, spiritual uh, education, art, and so forth. <coughs> So I, I embraced that in high school. And I started writing about it in my English assignments. I started uh, uh, reading about all these kind of poetry, you know, poet, poets. Poets. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there was one poem called I Am Joaquin. Mm -hmm. I, I think it was Corky Gonzalez. Right. And I read that poem and I said, man, that fits me. <laughs> if you ever get to read that, I don't know if you read it. It fits a lot of us as Mexican Americans because right. uh, 
I think at the end he mentions that I'm the uh, Christian Christ and the Aztec prince. Oh, like wow. That. So I'm like, oh, <laughs> you know, that's pretty heavy. You know? That is pretty deep. So, so, you know, because what I was looking at is my, the indigenous thinking and then the, uh, you know, the Mexican Catholic thinking. And then I was like trying to, you know, balance it out. And then um, when I carried it on to, to college, uh, to UTEP, I started exploring it more. I started do, using it more in my art. I started uh, writing more in my papers. Um, and then, um, and I think that's the time in high school I decided to make Chicano, Mexican American culture as my theme mm -hmm. or my art. But then when I went to college, um, there's, there, was, there was more to that because what I wanted to use, use that information that I learned right. through the Chicano movement and artists, poets, and, and started expressing it in my art, also through the information that I was receiving through uh, elders from Mexico, indigenous oh, okay. elders. Absolutely. That were not written words, but spoken words about the true meaning of the symbolism mm -hmm. of the Aztecs and Mayans. And then I said to myself, well, I didn't know about this, and there's a lot of people that I know don't know about this. So what I started doing was getting a symbol that will represent something and then incorporate it into my paintings. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, incorporate, you know, incorporate my experience as a Chicano, young Chicano here in the United States. So for you, it was always about art and creating things, right? So now you move on, you graduate. Where do you go from there? You start working uh, in education, you start teaching. Well, the goal was to you know, graduate, which I did. So I got my art, art degree, uh, art all levels, so I could teach from kinder to 12. Education, right? Education, mm -hmm. you know, teaching art. So I applied all the districts. Uh, no calls from the districts. Wow. You know? Uh, one, one district did call, this little district called. And, and in the interview, uh, the gentleman asked me, well, we have an opening for an English teacher. I said, well, I'm not qualified to teach English. <laughs> I went to uh, college to teach art. And he says, well, you know, if you, get, if you take this job, then you have a foot in the, in the district, and then you can get an art, art teacher position. I felt that I was not giving justice to the students. And I, said, I, I, I can't fake you know, right. teaching English or, you know, and I guess at the time a lot of people were faking it because I know in my high school days there were a lot of teachers there that were not qualified to teach what they were teaching. <laughs> <laughs> Especially the ones that will tell you in geography, uh, open the book and read chapter one and then turn it to the back and answer the questions in the back. And that's it, <laughs> and that's right? It. That's as far, that as, the as, far as the education goes. Was. But one thing that I'm absolutely picking up right now is the concept behind the way that you thought outside the box to your next step. Tell us what your next step was well, after that. The next step was I said, well, uh, I can't find a job. Um, I really like art. So I heard about El Paso Community College offering, at the time, a commercial art degree, associates, which now I think they call it advertising and marketing right. <laughs> design or something right. like that, and a fancy name. So I thought that was a good opportunity for me to learn how to market my work. So if I'm going to create a body of work, I need to move it, like sell it and all that. So I said to myself, well, if I, if I take this courses, you know, marketing, commercial art, I, in commercial art, I learned um, um, graphic cards, I learned airbrush, wow. which in the 80s, and I haven't moved from airbrush for a long time because now it's part of my painting technique. And that's something you incorporate every single day. Yes. So now that you're uh, creating paintings more often, what can we see uh, from you in the future? Are you creating some murals? Have you done anything recently? Well, <clears throat> From the, from the marketing, I also was thinking, well, I, I need to expand more than just painting. So then I created a, a business. <laughs> so I started, uh, I hooked up with some artists, and they were marketing their work 
through art prints. Nice. So learn how to go about that. So then I started getting a body of prints. And then I realized that uh, t-shirts, art, you know, designed on t-shirts are, are a good uh, product to bring people into your, you know. <laughs> your little world, To right? your world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you think you can expose them to their, your art. So that, I picked that up. So now I have a business that uh, create art prints. Uh, I, cliches, as I call them, fancy right. word for uh, canvas prints, and, um, and I do t-shirts too. And the latest piece that you've done is a mural up in Cloudcroft? Well, I was moving on to, yeah. um, from there, and then I picked up a uh, mural painting. Because one of my, you know, the three grandes that they call them in Mexico, yes. Rivera, Orozco, and Siqueiros, were all muralists, and I realized that I like that body of work that's big, Correct. you know. The so scale I, of it, right? Yeah, the scale of it. So I started painting big on my paintings, and then later on, I moved into murals. And my first mural was in Gaston High School, which uh, I, was doing, I was doing some workshops over there for my students, for an art teacher that called me in. And then she said, well, why don't we paint a mural? And then she showed me the wall, 18 feet by 40 feet. It's actually the wall for the library outside. And then I said, well, so I, I started playing with the idea of a, of a sketch. Right. And then I said, well, one of the things that I learned in marketing and, you know, and design is uh, to use what the client wants to see. Right. So in this case, the client was Gaston Independent School District. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, if I put the mural in the, if I put their logo in the center, uh, and then if they're going to love and, it, and right? I, and I put everything else that I want to put <laughs> around it, I think it'll sell, you know. And, and the idea, the things that were around it, was I was using the mascot of theirs, which is a plant, a panther. Mm -hmm. and then I, in, in my research, I found out that a, a black panther is actually a jaguar. Yeah, they're the same <laughs> thing. So I put a, a panther and a jaguar and to balance, you know, the high school, the culture, you know, 90% of the student body there is Mexican descent. So I right. Figured, you know. So that's what I did. And then I put the uh, movement of the river and the mountains and all the uh, vegetation that they... So lots they of nice there. detail. So if somebody wants to get a hold of you now, how do they get a hold of you? Do you well, have a web page, something like that? I have a like web that? page, uh, www.gaitanartworks.com. And then can they call you anywhere, or is that a place where they can well, order some merchandise? If in, in the website, I have my contact information. I have samples of my work, and I also have an e-gallery, electronic galleries, where they can see my murals and my painting. Beautiful. That I've done. Beautiful. Well, I wanted to thank Gabriel Gaitan for coming today, talking to us a little bit about himself and what he does. I also wanted to say thank you to the audience for tuning in. Every week, we're going to be having somebody totally different uh, interviewed here, and it's all about creativity. So thank you very much.